Okay, so uh, today the main uh, topic is that we're going to have a seminar uh, that's part of our exploration of decision making under deep uncertainty. And just a quick reminder that the deep uncertainty it differs from traditional uncertainty in the sense of this is very unpredictable events where the likelihood cannot be well characterized with existing data and models. And so at this meeting, we're gonna be uh, hearing about dynamic adaptive planning and how it might be applied to management issues in the Delta. And I think a nice feature of this seminar is we're gonna, we're gonna hear from people who are true experts in this. And uh, they're gonna talk about not only the techniques in general, but also um, some applications. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Obe to introduce our speakers more thoroughly. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you, everybody. I apologize for my technical difficulties earlier. And hi, Marilyn, and hi, Andrew. Thank you all for joining us uh, from Delphi. It's probably pretty late over there, but I appreciate you having time for us. So let me introduce both of you. Let me start with Marilyn. Marilyn Hasnut, she's a professor in climate adaptation in Deltas and Coors at uh, Utrecht University and Delta RS in the Netherlands. She specializes in water management, integrated assessment modeling, and also decision-making under high uncertainty, the topic of interest to us. She's actually the founder of the dynamic adaptive policy pathway approach that we have been thinking about. Her current research focuses on adaptive delta management and climate change ad adaptation. She has worked all around the world, including United States, the Netherlands, Bangladesh, Vietnam, and New Zealand. And she has also done work for the Delta Commissioner and the Ministry of Infrastructure and Water Management. And she has led many research projects for those agencies. She's a member of the Science Council of Delta RS and a member of the Society for Decision Making Under Deep Uncertainty, the conference that I attended um, last November. And, and more importantly, she's the lead author of a uh, uh, report for sixth assessment report of IPCC. In March, 2023, uh, Myline was appointed a member of the Science Climate, Co Scientific Climate Council of the Netherlands. And uh, this is an advisory body that provides, that provides um, advice to government, uh, whether it's unsolicited or solicited on climate policy issues. With that, let me introduce Andrew, our second speaker, a, a colleague. Uh, and he's an expert in climate adaptation in, in resilience and integrated planning at Delta RIS with over 15 years of experience in the water sector. Uh, his primary research includes methodologies to incorporate both long-term uncertainties and stakeholders in into the strategic planning process across diverse problem domains, including water supply and sanitation, water resources management, flood risk management, and urban water management. He's currently active in the European Union's mission adaptation program as part of its pathway to resilience project, supporting many European regions to develop transform transformational climate adaptation plan. He's an experienced facilitator and trainer and also worked in international settings. So we are very pleased to have both Myline and Andrew. And I guess I will hand over to Myline to uh, get the webinar started. Unless Lisa, if you have any comments or suggestions. Oh. Uh, I guess. Uh, I do not. Okay, Marilyn, uh, Edmund, can you can we allow Marilyn to share her screen, maybe? Yeah, yeah sure. screen. I should be able to do it. Thank you, Marilyn. Do you see my screen? Yes. Okay. Well, thank you, Obi, very much for this invitation, and uh, we are very honored um, to tell you about this dynamic adaptive policy pathways approach. Um, uh, I will start with like some overall um, yeah, explanation on the approach and, and uh, some experience, uh, and then Andrew will follow with some more uh, applications. Um, so, let me see, yeah. 
Um, just as an introduction, I um, we also like globally, but also in the Netherlands, um, we are we are feeling like we are facing this new climate reality. As like the IPCC said, this uh, climate change has already affected people and nature, and actually it will not become less. Um, and adaptation has reduced impact, but progress is uneven. It's largely incremental and it's not happening fast enough. So what we see also is that there are mechanisms in our climate system with a low probability and a high impact. For example, the ice sheet loss from uh, Antarctica, um, and which could result in a very rapid sea level rise. This is of high concern um, for many coastal uh, areas and deltas. Um, and in addition to that, there, there are like certainties um, from things that we know are, um, will happen. Like some impacts are already committed, but there are also many uncertainties, <clears throat> in particular in the rate and magnitude of change. Uh, and this depends largely, of course, on, on, on the global warming itself and the extent to which we mitigate uh, climate change. So with that, like this new climate reality, um, yeah, we have this dynamic adaptive policy pathways approach, in short, um, an adaptation pathways approach. Um, and it's actually the main idea is that we break adaptation into manageable steps over time and that we link the long term to the to the short term. So um, that actually every decision that we take is a meaningful step towards a uh, long term. And this helps to to start adaptation um, and adjust depending on how the future unfolds and also to avoid what we call maladaptation when, when actually um, adaptation um, is not effective or can uh, increase in, in larger emissions or can result in a, in a lock-in situation. So it's kindly, uh, kindly uh, visualized in the, um, in the picture here um, where you see this kind of route map with different routes that can be taken uh, where you can also switch to different routes. Um, and over time, there might come uh, more opportunities. You may have taken the wrong route, which could result in a, in a lock-in situation. And of course, the past also determines the available options and some pathways have been, uh, been locked out. So this is kind of uh, the, yeah, the main uh, idea behind this, uh, this approach. Um, and a way to uh, to deal with uh, large uncertainty. So to go a little bit more in detail, um, we typically make this adaptation pathways map, which shows the possible sequences of decision uh, to achieve the, uh, the objectives. So that's the, the main figure here. Um, and on the, um, on the right, you see a scorecard, which helps to evaluate the pathways and the, and the decisions. So again, this is this kind of sequence of alternative actions. Um, and underneath you see like a, an act, three axes. One is the changing conditions, which could be sea level rise or river flows or precipitation or temperature. Um, and you see different time horizons, which, um, which indicate the timing depending on a, a certain uh, scenario. Um, and then yeah, how to read these kind of maps. Um, here I will um, go through it. So in the current situation, at some point, um, the current measures may not be sufficient anymore because, for example, risk increases with climate change. And then here you see uh, four different options. In this case, it was about uh, navigating uh, the, the river under climate change using ships. Um, and with increasing climate change, the river inflow may uh, be reduced due to drought. Um, and then we could shift to medium-sized ships so we can navigate even during low flows or even small ships or small starts dredging the river, small scale or large scale. And then you can choose uh, the small ships. They are sufficient. They are good for the next 100 years or the large scale dredging. Or you can start using the medium-sized ships. But then at some point, this is also not sufficient. So you can switch to buying small ships or start uh, dredging large scale or small scale, that's the green line. Um, and then at some point, the small scale dredging is not sufficient. So we can then combine it with medium sized ships or small um, uh, switch to small ships or the start large scale dredging. So it's kind of, yeah, knowing uh, what are the options and also when to start uh, switching. 
<clears throat> so when to use this, uh, this approach, it typically is useful when there are decisions which have a very long uh, lifespan and a large societal impact. When there is a large sensitivity to these uncertain changes, so this deep uncertainty. Also, when there is risk of path dependency, meaning that uh, the decision that you take now influences the decisions that you can do in the future, or at least the effectiveness of these decisions. And also typically when there are high costs involved or potentially irreversible uh, impacts for, um, for people living in an area or for nature. So this is typically in, uh, shortly um, said is when there's potential of, uh, of high uh, regret. Um, <clears throat> and also just to say, it's not like the silver, uh, bullet, silver bullet for everything. It typically is an approach when there's this large uncertainty and long-term uh, impact. So um, the adaptation pathways approach, uh, the pathways map is very key to this, uh, to this approach. But in a way, it's similar to a policy analysis, which is uh, yeah, a systematic approach, uh, which starts with typically with identifying the risks um, in the present situation and in the future, identifying the uncertainties and also the long-term adaptation needs. And then we move to um, mapping the full solution space, including the options, and then also these thresholds of each option. So a threshold or, or Sometimes we call it an adaptation tipping point, which are the conditions under which this measure is not uh, effective anymore, or not sufficiently effective, and you, you don't achieve your objectives anymore. Um, and sometimes it's like a limit, so this measure is really not possible anymore. And, and there can also be opportunities, which can, um, yeah, which can have opportunities for new or additional action. So we map the full solution space and then start sequencing these measures, so that will be the next step, like explore, explore these alternative sequences and evaluate these sequences, these pathways, typically also together with stakeholders and try to align this also with, with maintenance of infrastructure, for example, and other societal um, goals. And based on this exploration of pathways, we can identify what are near-term actions, which are low regret or very robust, um, and what are long-term options? And then we typically start implementing the low regret uh, actions and we have uh, the long-term options which are implemented depending on how the future unfolds. Um, and then the monitoring informs this, this uh, implementation of, of follow-up actions. And sometimes monitoring results in identifying that we need to reassess the plan. So that's why we have this, uh, this circle. Um, so we are currently working on this analysis of this uh, approach, which I think now exists, yeah, more than 10 years. Um, and since then it has been applied in, in many um, regions across the world. So we are now assessing uh, the scientific literature and also some experiences in practice. Uh, and these are some initial results. Um, and what we have uh, found from an analysis of yeah, up to 300 papers and 230 really look at, uh, at case studies or have reviewed uh, the pathways approach uh, applications is that we see it has been applied in different policy domains, typically water, a lot of water applications, but also in transport and natural resources management and, uh, and agriculture, for example. And on the right, you see, uh, yeah, a figure of where it has been applied. So this indicates the size of the box indicates the amount of studies. Uh, so a lot of studies uh, have, uh, a lot of papers have case studies in Australia, in the US and New Zealand, um, and also uh, in the UK, in the Netherlands, but also in Indonesia, for example, and Bangladesh and Vietnam, there's quite some, uh, some studies on, uh, on pathways. Um, and what we also found by looking at all these papers and also um, uh, yeah, where it has been applied in practice is that it's now uh, starting to move really from theory to practice. It has been incorporated uh, in several guidance documents. We found 20 guidance, guidance documents around the world. Um, and we found about, yeah, from the total papers, about 70% as a case study of which about 40% uh, 
this was classified as a real world case study, um, really informing uh, a policy and has uh, stakeholder involvement. Um, and some of the guidance uh, documents are shown uh, below and also it has been applied in the recent IPCC uh, assessment of uh, AR6. Um, so looking at all these applications, uh, we do see different approaches uh, to uh, develop pathways um, from more like qualitative assessments with storylines and uh, model-based assessments. There are uh, approaches that really look into detail of, of these adaptation thresholds and some don't do that and make just a sequence of adaptation measures. There are pathway studies that look uh, from, the from now to the future, so typically forecasting, but there are also studies that, that do more like a backcasting approach and look at like a future vision and then uh, backcast, like what are the sequences of measures to get there. Now, various methods on uh, evaluation of pathways. Um, and we also identified some further developments that, uh, that, that are needed typically on the implementation uh, and the monitoring um, for sectors, um, mon for, for signals and um, yeah, actually increasing the complexity of multiple risk and, and, and sectors. Um, yeah, this is this is also a new result that we that we have. Um, we have, I think I have a slide uh, show about 160 examples of of pathways uh, visualization, and uh, and they are their types are shown here. So on the upper left, you see the typical metro map style um, visualizations uh, with adaptation tipping point, and some have more like a narrative style where, where they indicate different reasons to further adapt, which is um, panel B. And panel C is typically when, <clears throat> when you just indicate what are the short-term actions, the medium and the long-term actions. Um, and these uh, uh, pathways maps show uh, transfers between uh, different pathways. Um, they're also more like model-based pathways where they are really exploring like yeah, numbers of, of uh, potential futures. And then the, the bar plot or the stack bar plot is a way to visualize different sequences. So the color indicates one measure um, uh, and, and, and until when it is um, uh, sufficient to achieve objectives. And then there's also more pathways that look at yeah, narratives and use a pathway as a, as a metaphor. Typically, uh, for example, the timeline when they look at the past or a solution space type of um, pathway which kind of maps what are the available options and how that solution space shrinks um, uh, and sometimes uh, increases and what are drivers of, for, uh, for these uh, solutions to be available. Um, then I hand over to Andrew. So we start with the, with the applications. Yeah, thanks Marilyn. And good morning everyone, really pleased to be able to join, join you this morning. Uh, so as Marilyn has sort of explained in the last few minutes, the, the, the conceptual background behind behind the approach in, in general, but then also, uh, you know, the results from, from, from the studies that she's, uh, this review paper that she's, she's currently writing. What I'm going to talk about um, for the next few slides are, are some of the applications that we've um, uh, we've completed over the last 10, 10 years or so, but then also some of the lessons that we've learned from these applications. And, and that's very much what this, uh, this slide is all about. What we've found with the approach is that it works best. And by default, this just seems to happen when it's completed in a very phased approach. Um, and when, and what I mean by that is when you, you go through and you iterate through the approach several times, and, and in gradually increasing the level of detail and the level of analysis that you that you perform in, in, in each of those um, iterations. So in terms of the staging, what we often do, and, and the, the importance of this first step cannot be overstated. And, and to be honest, today's meeting is, is, is part of that, um, is around awareness raising and, and providing an introduction to the approach. Why, why we do the approach, why, um, why we undertake pathways planning, uh what what you know what are the potential challenges that we are going to 
face in the future and, and how can we perhaps deal with those? So there's various ways that we can do that, webinars such as this, um, but then also we, we, we developed a serious game um, called Sustainable Delta, the, a, a screenshot of which you can see in the top, top right-hand corner of the, the slide, which really gives um, people an experience of planning under uncertainty. Uh, and, and so that's, it's, 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 it's a really nice primer to get people on board with why, we're, why we want to think in this way, why we want to start planning and incorporate um, pathways principles in, into, our, into our plans. Um, and from there, it serves as a as a as, as setting up a common uh, knowledge base or um, set of experiences that you can then start to talk about real world problems. And that's where we will move into the next step. So, uh, Marilyn, if you could click forward, thanks. Um, into the actual applications of the approach, so the iterations of the approach, where initially what you would do is something, or what we do is 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 a very qualitative analysis. It's very quick. It's, it's, it doesn't need to take uh, much time, maybe half a day, maybe a day, maybe two days, but it's more workshop-based, sitting around, um, as you can see in the photos, having a discussion about the problem, setting those objectives, looking at the, uh, framing the problem, looking at the uncertainties that, that are of concern, what options we have available to, to, to to deal with any risks or or seize the opportunities that, that, that might pre, uh, present themselves, and then start to think about well, just in a relative sense, based on expert judgment, based on stories, what do we think we would do first? What do we think we would do next? Are there um, some dependencies that we can already identify between the various options? Um, and the thing and and the whole purpose of this this initial stage is really basically to scope the analysis for the next stage, right? So it, it helps to throw out some things that you already know aren't going to be feasible or aren't going to be attractive to, to, your, um, to, to your stakeholders and then and, and it helps to provide a you know boundary condition and scoping for the for, for, for later more say quantitative assessment. And that's where we would move into this level two type of analysis where suddenly yeah Let's bring in some quantitative information. Maybe that comes from reports or previous studies, but maybe um, we're also um, uh, also you know conducting some modeling ourselves, building some models um, and, and you know, calculating tipping points and, and so forth. So and then what you see in that level two uh, type of analysis is that the qualitative or narrative pathway that you develop in that first level, which an example of which it would be um, on the on the right side uh, of the of the screen, the, the sort of pencil drawing, the whiteboard drawing of a pathway, that starts to get a little bit more um, you know, detail in there and starts to take on the form of a, of, of the metro maps that uh, that Marilyn's already spoken of. Uh, and then there is also a further level of analysis where there's a full assessment of pathways. Multiple pathways are, are, are modeled under multiple scenarios. But again, that's something that one would undertake if it was needed to further the decision making process. So by phasing the approach in this way, what we're trying to do is 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 um, to avoid decision paralysis within uh, within an institution. And an institution can take a decision, get the information that they need, to, to progress that decision and progress that plan. Whether a level one analysis is sufficient for that, perfect. If if level two is needed, then do that. And if level three um, is warranted, then go only then go to go to that level. Because often with that level three type of analysis, this is where specialized modeling tools and alternative uh, decision making under deep uncertainty methods such as robust decision making and so forth. Um, this is where those types of methodologies fit in. And these are more resource intensive, um, require specialized models and, and, and so forth. Uh, next slide, Marilyn. So just to talk about a couple of applications. This is an application which um, I know Obe is obviously very familiar with uh, and uh, the rest of the audience may also be. So I'm not gonna to talk too much about the details 
of um, of the Miami study. But what what I really like about the Miami study is it really demonstrates this implementation of of that phased approach. So briefly, um, the Miami study it was a flood risk management study for the C7 basin, uh, looking at how it may uh, how uh, flood risk management may be able to to deal with increasing sea level um, and the various strategies that would be available to it. And so in terms of that phasing process, it started with, as I've indicated, a, a, you know, a conversation with stakeholders around the table, with maps, thinking about potential options, thinking about the risks, thinking about the vulnerabilities, looking at where um, existing flood impacts are, 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 um, are experienced, and hypothesizing what that might look like under future sea level rise scenarios. And the output from that initial workshop is that, that, uh, that pencil drawing that, that we saw on the previous slide. Finally, we, then following that, that provides some, some boundary conditions, some constraints on, well, what do we want to analyze? What do we want to assess if we are going to um, put a little bit more meat on, on the analysis? And, and, and perform more quantitative analysis. So this is so a, a, a modeling uh, a model, uh, modeling analysis was set up, and that calculated the tipping points um, uh, for various options uh, according to expected annual damages, and that's what you see the results of these uh, that analysis. So this, these are the modeling outputs, putting some quantitative um, uh, detail to those initial qual more qualitative narrative driven pathways. We see that there's, there's, there's several options in the graph you see, um, and some of the options perform better than others. For example, um, the, uh, the, the, the top line uh, with no additional measures, we see that we've already reached our, our, our threshold, which was set, which is the dashed line. And as the future, as sea level rises into the future, that, that uh, the damages are expected to increase. With several, with two sets of measures implemented, local flood mitigation or elevate or, or elevating um, uh, the ground, we see that they, they 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 have the effect of reducing those those tipping points or delaying the incidence of those tipping points um, by by several decades in some instances. Okay, next next slide, uh, Marilyn. Thanks. And from that quantitative analysis, you can then build up a metro map. And that's what we have here on the, on the, on the right. Uh, and you start to say, well, okay, do I need further analysis or do I have enough information now to advance my plan? What we can see from, from this example is that um, the, uh, uh, you can click forward, uh, Marilyn, the, the land use me measures, so, those rather transformational large measures where raising of the land is required, they're needed eventually should the sea level rise beyond uh, beyond you know one one and a half feet. It will be required. However, the earlier measures, the regional flood mitigation, the local flood mitigation, those types of options, they do buy you time. Okay, so that allows you time to work out, well, hang on, how much do I think the sea level is going to rise? Should I be raising, uh, if I'm going to have to switch to a land use measure, should I switch to a six foot elevation, a seven foot elevation or an eight foot elevation? It gives you more time to work out um, whether or not, or how, to, how to make that bigger decision and, and, and in, a, in a more informed manner and with improved data. Okay, next slide, Marilyn. So that, that's just a, a really nice example that encapsulates how we move from a level one analysis into a, sorry, a yeah, level one analysis into a level two analysis. And there was no need for a level three analysis in that instance. Um, this example is, is one that's come out of New Zealand uh, where it's, it's, there's been an entire process around mainstreaming pathways thinking into national climate adaptation strategy building. And this is something that has taken, you know, de about a decade or even more than a decade if you, you know, um, if you go back uh, 
to some of the original um, drivers for, 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 for this type of thinking. And what it took is essentially a change agent um, with good connections within government who got interested in the approach, contacted Marilyn and started exploring um, how the approach could be applied within, uh, within New Zealand. The game was used, Sustainable Delta game was used to, to raise awareness with, it, with stakeholders within, um, within New Zealand, both at the municipal level, but then also at higher government levels um, as well. Some pilot studies were, 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 under, were undertaken, one of those being the Hutt River um, flood risk management study, looking at how um, a pathways approach could, could inform the thinking to, to maintain um, a flood protection level uh, for, 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 that, uh, for that community. And this work continued over the, over the years following 2015, such that uh, pathways thinking and the, and, and the dynamic adaptive pathways approach um, found its way into uh, the, 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 the national guidance for, for municipalities on coastal adaptation. So it's now effectively municipalities when they want to know how can they implement a climate adapt, sorry, how can they develop a climate adaptation strategy? They go to this guidance and they are recommended to implement um, the dynamic adaptive policy pathways approach. But it, it, it's a process and it takes a long time to get this sort of um, uh, buy-in, both at, high, at all levels of government. And, and that's, uh, that's what, um, that's, that's, that's one of the wonderful things about this, uh, this this example, or this set of examples rather, um, in that it, as long as as, as long as um, as long as that change agent is initially there, uh, the groundwork can be done, the awareness raising can be done. Suddenly, uh, you, you can you can really start to deliver some some, some impact. The next slide, now. Thanks. Now this is another another example uh, showing something slightly different from Australia. Um, some work that I did with an Australian water utility, and it speaks to some of the future developments that um, that Marilyn mentioned in, in one of her previous slides. Where one of the the things about the original um, pathways approach was that it, it was very much focused on single sector, single issues, um, and 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 coming up with an adaptive plan to deal with. To, to deal with a single challenge, essentially, for example, flood, flooding. Now, what the utility asked us to do was essentially say, well, hang on, we have many objectives that we're trying to um, trying to to reach. We're trying to um, obviously deliver de de deliver water supply to our customers, but we're also um, having to deal with their wastewater. We're having to maintain environmental quality, uh, where, and and so forth. And so, what they were looking for was how can we take this pathways approach and take it up, um, up, 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 up a scale level, so that we can look at our entire system in an integrated fashion. And so, essentially, what we what we did together with uh, with a consultancy in Australia, Oracle, was elaborate the frame, uh, elaborate the um, the approach to, to deal with that integration question. And essentially, what we did um, was basically say, look at each of your um, core objectives in isolation, develop um, a pathways, uh, adaptation pathways for each of those, um, each of those issues, then try and look for the interdependencies and the synergies and, um, and any conflicts that may, may emerge from those and synthesize them into a single integrated plan. And this thinking is, 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 is currently being echoed in some of our um, European projects as well, when we're looking at multi-risk and multi-hazard situations. Uh, next slide, Marilyn. And an implementation of this, um, although not the integration element, uh, but uh, as I say, this is a utility that is very much early in its pathways journey, and, but this, and this is one of its, its first pathways applications where they were looking at how they were going to adapt their biosolids management strategy. And what was interesting about this is that when they started, um, uh, when we started working on this, uh, on this case, we were thinking that 
the, the main issue we were going to deal with is uh, increasing sludge volumes such that uh, we wouldn't be at, we wouldn't have sufficient um, uh, facilities with which to, to 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 manage these. But what actually emerged from from the level uh, level one type of analysis, just sitting around um, talking about the challenges, was that the issue was not about sludge volumes, but the issue was about regulation. So at the moment in Australia, a lot of uh, biosolid sludge is just applied to land, which may or may not be similar to, to the case in, in, um, in the United States. And what, 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 what is of con main concern to this utility is if the regulations should change such that, you, um, such that sludge can no longer be applied to land. And that would be due to reasons because of PFAS and, um, and, 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 and other such issues. So that because of the environmental risks, it's no longer allowed. So consequently, utility was got, was was set was setting itself the problem. Well, if we can't continue to to apply this sludge to land, what are we going to do with it? Because yes, the volume is going to increase with population growth, and so of course they started looking at the different options they had: centralized versus decentralized options, um, advanced treatments, thermal treatments, incineration. All of them were on the table, and and uh, this was essentially their first uh, first pathways map that they they were able to develop, uh, the or the adaptive pathways map they were able to develop. These what what is on the screen are the preferred pathways. You can see that there are several other pathways that have been greyed out or, or pushed to the background, um, and they were ones that were were, were deemed less preferred in, in, in a multi criteria analysis. And what the utility did from this pathways map was, yep, next slide, Marilyn, thanks. Um, was basically elaborate that into a complete roadmap for which for, for the coming uh, for the coming ten uh, well, five to ten years, where they identified the key decision points where they would need to um, where they would need to make a call as to whether or not they were going to choose a decentralized strategy or a centralized strategy. And, and which technologies they were going to um, to, to invest in, in and, it, and you know the elaboration included further investigations and studies and so forth. Next slide, um, Alan. And this, this is another case. Uh, this is one from from the Philippines for the Cebu water supply, another water supply um, application. And this one's uh, instructive in a for a different. Um, for a different reason. In the, uh, what we tried to do is, this, this is dealing with a, 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 a large city um, on an island in the Philippines that is undergoing water stress. It's, uh, it's, it's um, a previous Deltara study had, had indicated that um, under future climate change scenarios, uh, water, the water gap was going to be significant and it needed to identify some, some alternative sources to be able to de deliver the demand um, that, uh, that was required. And there were various options that were, were available to, to, um, to the authority there uh, um, to increase that supply, being new dams, being upgrading weirs, putting in groundwater wells and so forth. And when we sat down together with the, with the stakeholders to, to, to develop a pathways map, looking at how we might sequence these options, what came out of the discussion was very, very quickly, we realized that all of the options that they had on the table were needed if they were to service the demand projections that they were dealing with. And as you can see from the, the, the timeline, um, many options were needed, even in a low climate change scenario by, by, uh, by the 20. Uh, 2040 time horizon, but then if climate change was 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 um, went beyond those those expectations and tended more towards the high scenario, all of the options could be needed before the end of the decade. But straight away, just doing pathways, um, starting to uh, the pathways map itself wasn't, um, or, or the sequencing wasn't ended up not being so uh, so important. But the pathways thinking demonstrated that 
the authority needed to identify different um, different options, and they 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 found that out early, which is one of the benefits of of the approach by taking a longer term perspective. Uh, they can identify whether or not there are already limits to 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 the catalog of options that they have available to them, and the sequencing of the options. Next slide, Marilyn. Rather, didn't need to follow according to lock ins or dependencies or or these sorts of things because they were all needed but rather could follow something a little bit more simple based on cost effectiveness choose the measure that was going to give you the biggest bang for the bus for your buck first and then and then follow on from that um, next slide Marilyn. and actually i hand back to Marilyn because now Marilyn's <laughs> going to talk much more about the 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 applications here in the netherlands for um, which she's been much more intimately involved with than, than i have yeah, thank you, Andrew. Uh, a lot of applications. I, I hope you still find it useful. Um, I, this is the final application, and then and then and then we stop. And uh, uh, would like to get some questions from you. Um, we thought that it would be nice to have this uh, this Dutch example, um, because also because of the 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 whole governance around this application is that I think in the Netherlands we uh, we are a low lying country, which uh, quite vulnerable um, to flooding. Um, so the government wanted to um, anticipate climate change, in particular sea level rise, um, um, increasing river inflows and, and droughts, and, and installed the Delta program. Um, and they used the adaptation pathways approach as part of what they call adaptive Delta management. There are several um, more like governance and institutional aspects to it. So everything is with Delta, which you may like. It's like, so we, it's set in, in the law, we have a Delta Act. There's um, long-term funding, like multi-year, multi um, a considerable amount of funding for each year, which is uh, beyond the political um, uh, um, uh, period. Um, so the Delta program, which has a, a Delta commissioner, which is a, a person that, yeah, that is leading this whole uh, program and based on the exploration of different uh, impacts and different strategies, they have uh, developed an adaptive plan with what they call delta decisions. Um, so in this in this analysis, they explored um, many different pathways for different regions uh, in the Netherlands for floods and for droughts. Um, and in the plan itself, we have these kind of maps, which again, you see the different time timelines for different scenarios. Um, and here you see different sequences of measures. So this one blue box is the uh, short-term uh, measures, and then the mid-term, and then you have long-term uh, measures. And um, the upper line is is from the for the regional um, water managers, and the lower uh, line, lower pathway, is for the national water managers. So what is special, I think, about this pathways map is it, it's a sequence, and it shows what are the measures for different actors. Um, uh, they do, uh, for the regional, they, they show only one pathway, right? So ideally, uh, behind this, there are multiple pathways, but then also to, to be able to, sh to shift um, in case the future turns out differently or uh, to accelerate uh, if, if it, it goes faster. So that, that's, that's still a bit of a challenge, I think, but they decided to, uh, to keep the pathways map in the uh, in the adaptive plan simple, um, and to show mostly the preferred adaptation pathway. Um, and in, in addition to that, they have what they call a signal group. This is a group of experts. Um, I'm part of that, um, and we look at uh, what what is happening. Are there any signals that, for example, that climate change is going faster? Are there new insights that we need to take into account um, that require um, changes to the adaptive plan or that require additional measures. Um, and so this is assessed um, every year. And then um, every six year, there's a whole, yeah, there's a full reassessment of the plan uh, to see also, to look also at whether implementation is going well and whether the measures are uh, effective. Um, yeah, this I think I have already mentioned. So this whole signal group, one of the signals that was mentioned is, uh, was about accelerated sea level rise and a potential large contribution from Antarctica is really an example of, of deep uncertainty. Uh, and then we use this adaptation tipping point approach or thresholds uh, that people sometimes prefer to use uh, this word. 
um, and we looked at different uh, key elements of the of the um, of the water system and in our case it's the storm shit barriers which are very important and we looked how will they function are they effective with increasing sea levels but also the water supply um, the pumping of the rivers uh, to the sea and the amount of sand that we need to maintain our dunes and this already raised uh, yeah, concerns because these measures, uh, they would have huge impact. So that's where we came up with this. Can we continue with our adaptation um, strategy with the adaptive plan that was initially developed uh, by the Delta program? Maybe we should look more at more uh, transformative measures. And that is when we uh, developed these kind of these four strategies, um, which are visualized here. Um, where you see the Dutch uh, Delta. So clearly we now have a protect open strategy with an open connection between the rivers and the sea. But with increasing sea levels, our yeah, levees uh, along the river would, be, would need to be much, much larger. Um, and uh, an option would be, could be to, uh, to close off the river. So we go to protect closed, but then we would need to pump out the rivers. The Netherlands would be safe. Eh? We would all be behind our storm surge barriers, uh, behind our barriers, I should say. Um, and but then, yeah, pumping out the river is, is of course a major transformative decision. An option would be to go advance, make a new coastline, uh, which has a benefit. Eh? You would create new area. It's also sometimes called uh, attack, um, and uh, there would be place a uh, space for. Yeah, storing the rivers in case of high river uh, discharge. But we would still need to pump out the rivers and we would need a huge amount of sand to make this new coastline uh, there. And so a fourth strategy is also to live more with water and accommodate and like floating houses or building on stilts, but also at some point, um, yeah, give more space to this water and, and, and relocate in, in some areas. So these are huge strategies which are con um, currently further uh, explored uh, by the government and, uh, and we are helping with that. Um, and for that, we also explore different pathways. So the, here it was typically more like a backcasting and forecasting approach, um, looking at different reasons to shift or further adapt. Um, so we really looked at, at the pivotal decisions and not in detail at, at, the, um, at the adaptation tipping point. So each... Um, branch in each circle is um, describes a reason to further adapt. And these can be uh, adaptation measures like typical uh, water management measures, but also opportunities like spatial development in the coastal zone could trigger a transition towards um, advance. Um, so to end, <laughs> I hope uh, it's, it is quite a lot, I, uh, I, I feel, but um, we, would, we wanted to give uh, like a full, um, yeah, our experience uh, of this, yeah, more than 10 years of pathway studies. Um, it's really a, a means to, to support decision-making under uncertainty. And if implemented well, it can help to um, yeah, increase the solution space and avoid maladaptation. And we see that it's increasingly applied uh, in practice, uh, which is needed, I think, given this new climate reality. And it helps to break this adaptation, this big chunk into manageable step and identify what are the key decisions, which decisions are very important. Um, give, looking at this whole uh, experience and this, all these studies, not only by us, but by many other people, we do see that there are many approaches. So yeah, that can also be seen as a benefit. It's really tailored to different uh, situations. Um, and if maybe later, if there's a, some time, we also have a short video that kind of ex with an interview um, of, with uh, one of our soccer players that illustrates what this adaptive pathway thinking uh, is. But I think maybe for now we we, uh, we stop and take some questions. Well, Marilyn and Andrew, that was a wonderful presentation. Thank you for uh, putting that together. I have to say, every time a question came up in my mind, your next case study would answer it. So it was very uh, thoughtfully put together. Uh, and now we are going to open it up to questions from uh, the public is also welcome to ask questions, board members, anyone who has anything. I can kick things off if we're, if it goes slow. Edmund, uh, can you just interrupt if there are any questions um, being raised by the public? 
Got it. Um, there are none right now, but just to remind the public, if you have any questions, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom and we'll call on you when it's time. We also have a Q&A function in Zoom, so you can also type in your questions in the Q&A and we'll get those answered. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Yeah, Tom, go ahead. You say Tanya, Tanya or Tom? I said Tom. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, my question has to do with the um, the time axis. I noticed the, like it was it was kind of clever in the Philippine study where you uh, use two different time bars. Uh, but another way of doing that, it would seem to me, would be to treat it as a uh, a variable. Um, the The uncertainty of a pathway may be a lot larger than the uncertainty of um, the time bar on it. And I, I'm just curious whether you've tried to uh, treat time in a statistical way, because it would give you a better sense of, of urgency, uh, because you'd have a probability to go with it. Should I? <laughs> um, yeah. I, um, well, we didn't put probabilities uh, on this time axis, uh, because that would also, I think, mean, mean that we would put probabilities on the scenarios. But what we did do is um, uh, explore a huge amount of time series and then make uh, box whisker uh, plots for the, the timing of when a new measure would be needed. And then in some situations, there would be a very narrow uh, time window and in other situations that would be broader so then the signals are very uh, important to know when to further adapt and wh where did the uncertainty come from in the box whisker plots was it from the scenario um, or the time axis um that uh ah, okay i think uh, in some cases, this was the scenarios, and it could be used also from the conditions. I think if you would add, uh, include more uncertainties, um, for example, um, we also looked at different values. So for some, um, different have different uh, different people have different risk um, acceptance. So maybe some persons would uh, like to adapt earlier. So that would be an earlier. Uh, reason to adapt while others have a higher um, risk acceptance. Yeah, I think I okay. will answer your, your question. Yeah. But yeah. if you have other ideas, I'm very curious to, <laughs> to hear. <laughs> but. Yeah, excellent talk though. I enjoyed it. I, I learned a lot. This this is not an area I work in, so it, uh, it was a, a lot of new material. Thanks, Tom. Tanya, you, you want to go ahead? Yeah, thank you, Myerlin and Andrew. This is such a uh, really informative talk, and I, I also learned a ton. Um, my question is around this idea of the risk of path dependency, and how do you tease out or figure out which pathways could put you at risk for path dependency, and how do you overcome some of the cognitive biases that we have in being able to see things like path dependency. Wow, that's a, that's a really interesting question, Tanya. Um, I think the way that we tend to deal with path dependency is we, we that, I mean, it's one of the, the, the part of the thinking that went behind the, the, the Metro map was that by looking far enough in, a, in advance and looking at how you might like what your adaptation um, possibilities are, that would highlight whether or not you were tending towards path dependency or not. So part of it is taking that 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 long term view. Um, however, in terms of overcoming cognitive biases, that's 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 a trickier one. I mean, ultimately, we we we're reliant upon stakeholder values, stakeholder perceptions. Um, and yes, there's data that informs these processes, and perhaps that 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 serves to shift some of these biases in in some way. But I mean, we're, I've also been in, in in involved in many many um many processes where or projects where I've been asked to develop a pathways map that 
concludes with, and by the way, we want you to end with this solution, <laughs> um, which to me flies in the face of the whole the whole, the, the, the whole approach. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so it's, I think what the, 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 the pathways map can show or, or, or thinking pathways thinking can show is that it does tend to open up the, um, the, the, the solution space or the thinking um, or if stakeholders thinking in terms of what may be possible and what we try to strive to do, and this talks a little bit to that example from the Netherlands that Marilyn spoke of um, in terms of uh, the, the longer term adaptation to sea level rise, is how to actually um, uh, motivate your stakeholders to think transformationally. Because I think that is that is that is one of the um, uh, one of the aspects of the approach that can deserves a little bit more attention um, and can help to break some of these path dependent thinking. Because if you have to think tra transformationally, um, if you have to be thinking, well, hang on, what we're doing now is not going to con like all our incremental adaptation that, that, that we're currently undertaking. It's not going to serve us for the long term. We're going to have to transform the way we operate what does that mean the earlier you can start having those conversations and, and the more um uh what's the how, how to say this the 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 less skin in the game the people themselves have like so the more objective they can be about that sort of those sort of discussions um the better and that's 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 one way to to, to try and overcome these biases but they're present for sure Caroline, maybe you want to add something to that. Yeah, I think in one study, uh, together with the World Bank and, and also the Dutch government, we looked at um, that what we call transfer costs. So in some situations, uh, the pathway is still possible, but the, the, the final cost, the total costs are much larger because you have to shift to, to some action. So it's not like really a fixed lock-in, but it does introduce much more... Um, much more cost and can have not only in, in financial, but also for society or for, or for nature. So we, we just objectively showed um, two time horizons and, and different pathways and looked at the costs and benefits uh, um, to illustrate this. I just want to ask a follow up question to that. And then uh, I'm going to do the chat question and then we'll go to uh, the other hands. So. Uh, so related to that, I'm curious about which performance metrics are most influential to people's thinking. Is it is it generally cost? Is it duration? What are what are some of the performances that are most important? I think it's context specific. Genuinely, um, I think it, it like if we're dealing with risk, uh, and it depends on the the the, the level of impact. The magnitude of impact. If the magnitude of impact is 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 truly great, then that actually does leave. And from um, a lot of the a lot of times, what we're finding now with with some of these pathway studies is we're dealing with these low probability, high impact, um, uncertain uh, uncertain futures, and that's really tricky for a decision maker. And it's not that the pathways approach is going to provide the answer to to how you make have which decision you should make, but rather it helps to inform that these are the potential uh, uh, dangers that you have on the horizon um, and, and, and looks at the options that you have available. But it's still, the hard decision remains with the, with, uh, with, with, uh, with the decision maker. Um, but yeah, so in terms of, but, but going back to your question, in terms of performance met metrics, sometimes it's impact, but yes, cost is, is is often a very, very much a, a, a leading one. Thanks. Okay, Marilyn, did you want to add anything? No. Okay. And I think the, you may have partially answered this question from the chat, but Shoko Shinbrat asks, when developing pathways maps with members of the public, what were some of the concepts that were most difficult to convey to them? Um, the concepts that I've found people, uh, the concept that, that I found people struggle most with is, is, is the tipping point con concept. 
For a problem domain such as flood risk management, it's perfect. It works really, really well. When you're talking about a water level and everyone thinks about the bathtub, the bathtub fills up and then it overflows. You have a very clear tipping point. But when you're dealing with other, um, other problem concepts, that tipping point concept starts to um, uh, starts to be a little bit more abstract in, in some ways. And even, even the, the, way, the way that we draw the pathways maps um, can, can, can be confusing because it's not about an increasing water level, for example, but rather um, it's about a, yeah, a decreasing water availability. And it, 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 it can translate, or, but it, it often requires a little bit of mental gymnastics on the part of stakeholders. So that's, that's one that I've, I've found that, uh, um, that, uh, that stakeholders do struggle with. Um, but uh, Marilyn, do you have some other ones? No, I, I agree. And and then not only stakeholders, but also some scientists object to like it's not really a tipping point. It's like yeah. it's like an objective that is not reached. Um, so that's why we sometimes use this word threshold or say there is a reason to further adapt. And this can be any reason. And so you have not enough material, you don't accept a, a, a certain impact. Um, and, and then people can overcome. And if, if that is difficult, we start to just sequence. What, what to do first? What could you do next? And if that's not good, what you, would you do next? Without saying what is not good. Yeah? So, so, and sometimes it can be useful to keep that fake. Um, and, and sometimes it's useful to really discuss this objective and reason to further adapt and this adaptation tipping point, because it also makes it clear that there's like an objective norm. So it, depending on the situation, it can be useful to to do talk about it. And sometimes it's better to continue and just talk about sequences. Yeah, um, just to build on that comment of Marilyn's, it's a, it's a really, uh, really good one, is the way that we treat, like what we just presented was was the approach. Um, it would be very easy for you to, 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 to go home and think, well, I need to do step step one, followed by step two, followed by step three, followed by step four, um, in, a, in a very, you know, uh, um, dogmatic way but the way we implement the approach now is is much more flexible we take what works but given the context and as, as Marilyn said sometimes the adaptation tipping point concept works and is useful so so we use it sometimes it's less useful so we don't so we don't um uh don't highlight it so 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 strongly other times in other problem contexts you you're dealing more with opportunities and that may be leading uh, the decision, the decision making, and opening up the solution space. So, um, you know, something might become a, a, a possible a possible option in in twenty years time, and you want to know that that's that that that's in your in your toolbox, if you will. Um, and that could that could that could be leading. So, the, it's the flexibility of the approach um, that that uh, it, that is something that is also important to highlight. And it's it's one that we, as I say, the concepts. Of pathways thinking are always ever present when we're, when we're trying to apply the approach but it's not that we do it dogmatically in the same way every single time and it also depends if you're doing it qualitatively quantitatively and the methods that you're employing okay so what i'm hearing is these tipping points are a little bit fluid in in concept in that they might be a real tipping point as at the, when the when the sea level hits this some infrastructure stops working or it might just be more of a goal is that what you're saying okay Okay, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it, it there are very like physical um, thresholds, like as in a flood risk um, situation, that you can point to and say that's that's I need to change at this point. But when you're talking about more value related things or um, economically economic related uh, thresholds that might be surpassed. Yeah, as I say, often these can these can change and they be they can be dynamic um as as value shift and perspective change so you have to be an, uh, open to that as a as, as a decision maker oh that's that's really helpful to know inga go ahead thank you oh thank you for this great presentation i really enjoyed it um and i was very impressed with the new um 
Netherlands example of approaching sea level rise. Um, one reason why I was impressed is because you really included um, water conservation in their measures and uh, included the stakeholders. Um, even accepting shortages was in there. I, I, I really like that. Um, but the question that arises for me is also cost related. When I was looking at the final adaptation plans where you showed um, you know, adapting the coastline in various ways. And then the last one was, um, what was it? Accommodate and retreat. I, I thought to myself, well, um, in terms of cost, adapting the coastline, you know, changing the rivers, putting in pumps, uh, hauling huge amounts of sand. I mean, wouldn't it be, um, more cost effective to, and these are all long-term things, um, wouldn't it be better to work towards a worst case scenario and try to work towards that accommodate and retreat concept? Um, wouldn't that in the end be more beneficial and cost effective? That's an interesting question, and I think it's part of the <laughs> it's part of the debate that we are having. So I I I have to say that like the current plan is up to one meter of sea level rise, and then we can typically continue with what we have a little bit of raising levees and, uh, but with the multi meter sea level rise, of course, we get this transformative decisions so so far we are in this kind of process where from these visualizations and like more like key strategies towards more detailed analysis of what would it actually mean if we would do the protect closed and pump out the rivers how much is the pump capacity and i can tell you it's huge it's about 10 to 20 times more the largest pump in the world so that's a huge but still if I look at the discussion that is, is happening now in the, in the Netherlands, there's like people that think, well, we can do that. We just put 10 of these big pumps or 20, right? So, so and we are a rich country and there's a lot of investment in the lower part of the, of the country. There's other people that say, um, but it's completely against uh, nature. And we should, uh, given the long term, given the, the path that we are now on with the emissions, we should prepare for really a larger amount of sea level rise. And that includes giving more room for water and start already now. And we are uh, now starting to, there's this, um, we need to build a lot of homes uh, at the moment. So where are we going to build this? So I'm not saying what we need to do. What we are doing is just mapping the solution space and discuss the consequences and the pivotal decisions. And it's it's resulting in a, in in a discussion that we're and we're continuously looking in more detail at the consequences. There's no final answer yet, but when we have, I uh, <laughs> I'll let you know. I'm oh, also curious. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's really at the heart of it. Obey. Yeah, thank you, Malan and Andrew. Excellent presentations. I have one question and one clarification, actually. Uh, the question is, and I think it was in the New Zealand study, there was this situation they found a champion among decision makers to promote this concept. So my question is, do you have any suggestions how to look for, find those champions? And my clarification is, I think it was in the Australian study, the drivers does not have to be an environmental variable. It could be some kind of policy or regulation coming up. And I saw time associated with that I, in a context of Bay Delta, that could be the case. Some politics might change or maybe some regulations might change. So the concept of threshold could equally work for those situations as well, right? That's just a clarification. So two part question there. Um, I'll, if, I'll, I'll, I'll have a first crack at this, Marilyn. Um, so so the, your, your first question was, how do you identify this champion? Yeah? 
So so my response to you, Obe, would be look in the mirror. And this I'm not and I'm not trying to be and I'm not trying to be flippant here. Um so but genuinely, so it's what we've found in each of these com each of the contexts you mentioned, okay? Um in 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 New Zealand, there was there was, a, a, a champion emerged. Uh in in Australia, um, a champion has emerged within this consulting firm, within Oricon, and he is really pushing the industry towards thinking in this way. And he's finding like-minded individuals, um, setting up a community of practice and so forth, putting a lot of energy into this. Um, in, in New Zealand, uh, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't so much a decision maker, um, a, 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 a civil servant rather, um, or former civil servant rather. And uh, yeah, one of the reasons that New Zealand has progressed so far in comparison to other contexts in, rela in, in relation to adaptive planning is because of the, of the effort that she she has been put, she had put in. She had the contacts contacts within government to be able to push the right buttons and make things happen faster than perhaps um, uh, than than say my contact in Australia who's working within a consulting firm, right? So things are moving a little bit slower there. But it's so look, ident identifying a champion is is um, there's no uh, there's no rule book rule book to doing this. Uh, it's more finding the person who sees um, sees uh, these issues as as being something to address. And we know of these people all around the world. And we um, and I would include yourself as one of those uh, to who who um, who want to pick this up and 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 drive this further within their organisations. Marilyn. No, I have nothing to add. I think you explained that. Okay. And yeah. sorry, the second question I've forgotten. Uh, it was uh, more like the, yeah, the threshold. I mean, on the horizontal yep. axis, yeah, drive, it doesn't have to be, it can be a regulation that might come at random time that may require a different path, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's a really, really good point. And thanks for raising it, Obey. With the, uh, with the Australian example, with that utility, um, the uncertainty around that regulatory change was, was was large. They don't know when it's going to happen. They really don't. It could, but uh, basically, to 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 overcome the decision paralysis and to be able to progress in their infrastructure planning because they they wouldn't have had time to implement if they just waited, right? And were reactive. They 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 made the call of well, we think it will occur within the next five to 10 years, so let's put it at this year. And then we think the next one might occur 15 years after that. And if that happens, it, it's more, it's, it, 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 it makes the analysis more exploratory in, in a way, in the sense that you're exploring what, what if this were to happen, what would I do? And then it become, the call becomes, um, it's not about assigning probabilities to this, but more it comes down to, the, the individual decision maker as to how likely they do feel that that uh, um, that eventuality will be, and then make a decision accordingly. As I say, the decision making is still difficult in this space, but what the process and the thinking and the, con the concepts help to tease out is 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 better informing that process and making that decision more more well informed. And more transparent even. Yeah. Thank you. Very informative. Um, Bob. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, it was excellent. Uh, it's really outside my uh, area of expertise, but I, I do have a question, and I hope it's not too naive. Uh, but it has to do with people. Uh, the timelines that you Show, you know, it's shown in your charts are very long. They're often, you know, decades to maybe even a century or so. And yet, when you look at uh, people, the decision makers, the the um, the local voices that come in, you know, to the discussions and so on, you know, their tenure is often very short. 
uh, on the order of just a few years, most times people retire, they go on to other things, they get promoted and so forth. And I was curious about how much of an issue is that in this in the in the process that you know you discussed today that you've got this very high turnover in opinions and ideas and or maybe you don't uh, but I assume that there is a high turnover in perspectives uh, you know uh, because of the people and yet you're you're doing long term uh, planning or uh, you know trying to put out scenarios that are long term. So anyway, I'm just curious about how much of an issue it is uh, with this relatively rapid turnover of people. Yeah, I think um, in uh, in yeah in many situations people do see that there are these long term impacts of of decisions. So, for example, if if it is about infrastructure, but then it's typically not citizens that take that decision. Um, I do know about, uh, we do have some discussion, like what is a realistic time horizon or uh, like how long do you have to look ahead? Um, yeah, that, so the, there of course, there's also different perspectives on. Um, I, I remember, I think it was both in a case study in Sweden and also uh, in New Zealand where they, they did do a participatory process with um, people living in the area from this more like longer term planning. And in both cases, they they agreed upon potential pathways, uh, but then in the end, they want everything implemented at once because uh, they felt now we have agreement, now we have the money, let's let's implement, no need to stage it. So that, that, that was their way of looking at, uh, at the approach. Um, yeah, I, I, I can see what you're meaning, but I haven't really experienced it myself in, in my applications. I don't know, it's Andrew? Um, I think, no, you raise a, a really good point. And again, it comes back to, to, to the problem domain, the context in which, in which uh, the plan is being developed. So often with, say, utilities, their planning time horizon, 10, 20 years, and that's 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 what they're interested in. So trying to get them to think about um, a century in advance, very very difficult. And and you definitely come up um, um, uh, come up uh, get get some opposition to that. Um, so yeah, it's but I what what we what we tend to do is. With the stakeholders, you try and get them to project as far ahead as they feel comfortable, right? Initially, this is initially, and this is why again this phasing is is critical, um, because these are the discussions that you're having in that in that level one type of uh, type of um, assessment. What do they feel comfortable with? Then look, let's look at what that looks like. But then you can use those results to you know, push them, push your stakeholders a bit. What if this isn't enough? What if we take a look further into the future? And again, looking at, uh, say, a water utility perspective, you can very easily get um, water utility planners who are happy thinking in of, you know, the current their, their, their current population projections and, and distributions and, and so forth and, 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 and climate change projections. Um, but then, and develop a plan for, for the next, yeah, 20, 25, you can get them out to 50 years. But then you can use that to problem and say, well, hang on, you're putting in place infrastructure that is going to be here for much, much longer. Don't you want to make sure that this infrastructure is going to serve you for that longer period? What if we just stress this a little bit, stress this system a bit more, take a, take a further, take a look a little bit further ahead. And you know, it, it, it sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Um, it really depends on the people in the room, and uh, but it can serve to to to, to stimulate um, an opening up of the thinking. But but yeah, it's not it's not easy. The time the time question is it's it's a really valid one. 
Well, that's great. Um, we should probably end there given the time available, but uh, I do just want to thank you for creating a lot of insights. Um, I think I can't resist asking one final question. Maybe we could just get a quick summary statement on this. So a common issue we hear about exploring this deep uncertainty is, well, we, we can't afford to do the thing that would protect us against the extreme event. So I wonder if you might just want to sum up what you see as the, the biggest value of this, given that constraint. Yeah, I, I, I can see that point. Um, and of course that depends on when this uncertainty may, may be relevant. Uh, I think with this adaptive pathways planning is that you, you can still think what is useful uh, now in terms of to prepare to, like for the minimum and what are like more like preparatory actions, not to build everything for the big largest uh, 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 future, but at least to be able to do it when it is going, when there are these signals that it's going to happen. And then still there is this trade-offs between, yeah, how long are you going to wait, when to start, and what's your risk uh, acceptance uh, actually, and 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 that is different. But, but like preparing, I think, well, if I look at the Netherlands, it's like, um, if we don't, um, we don't have enough time to further adapt. So if we want to live safely in this low lying delta, we, we it is necessary and that people uh, can, can see immediately. Um, just to, to build on that, I'd flip the question straight back around, to be honest, and say, okay, you can't afford to do what you need to do, all right? That's unfortunate. What are you going to do? Because what if this future comes to be? You're going to have to do something, right? Uh, so if your solution space is constrained by finance, by fin for financial reasons, fine. That's the reality. But then you still have a solution space. And maybe those some of those solutions are uncomfortable. But again, talking to the to the Dutch example and the conversations going around about some of these potential uncomfortable futures, accommodation retreat that we've already alluded to, best to start those discussions early. That's great. Um, the, the perspective being, if you uh, if you don't think about it, that's you'll still have it. Uh, the experience <laughs> and so no action is your solution right uh great that's great i really appreciate that all right well we'll wrap up now and say thank you thank you for staying up late for us and we really appreciate your time we hope that this is uh, going to contribute to our review that we're preparing for uh california decision makers and we appreciate this this very much um yes big big hand virtual hand yeah. Uh, and so, yes, if our speakers wish to leave now, you can. We have just a teeny bit of board business to take care of before we conclude the meeting. But thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for having us.